This next session is sponsored by Pistons Sports and Entertainment and will feature a live Twitter feed. To join the conversation, share your thoughts on Twitter. Please welcome Vice Chairman of Pistons Sports and Entertainment and Chair of the Board of Directors of the Detroit Regional Chamber, Arne Tello. Take your seats, please. <laughs> I was hoping there'd be, still be bourbon out here. Um, anyone, good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor for me to introduce our next speaker, Mark Cuban. I can't believe we got him to come to Mackinac Island. He's in the house, he's back there. I've had the pleasure to know Mark since my time as a sports agent and now on the ownership side with the Pistons. Mark hails from the Midwest, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm from Philly, so Pittsburgh is the Midwest to me. Mark developed his unparalleled, unparalleled selling and negotiation skills at a young age, hawking garbage bags, of all things, door to door at the age of 12. From there, Mark attended Indiana University, or as I refer to it, as the UM, U of M of Bloomington. Mark is a visionary businessman in the technology sector. He's built an entrepreneurial empire as pioneer of the dot-com revolution, now with a portfolio that consists of over 200 companies from technology startups in the healthcare industry to media and entertainment. As you all know, he stars on the hit show Shark Tank. My wife only regrets that she didn't sign that show many years ago. And is the author of the best-selling book, How to Win, at the sports business, an acumen he's shown since he took over the ownership of the NBA's D Dallas Mavericks in 2000 and winning an NBA championship in 2011. He's also one of the most passionate owners in the NBA, and if, and if I had to guess, the most fined. <laughs> <laughs> he's a fixture in the Dallas community and nationally through his work with the Mark Cuban Foundation which among other programs provides free artificial intelligence classes to underserved high school students across the US. I'm thrilled that Mark is joining us today and I know we all look forward to hearing his many insights. Joining Mark on stage as moderator is Casey Crane, the president and CEO of Crane Communications. Casey oversees the day-to-day -day operations of Crane Communications and their family of brands, including automotive news, and advertising age. KC, like Mark, lives by the ethos of doing well by doing good, recognizing the responsibility of giving back to society and the community, which he does by chairing the Detroit Children's Fund. He's a great friend and golfing buddy of mine. Recently, he invited me to play with him, and Scotty Scheffler joined our group. Not too bad, huh? Not too shabby. Anyway, please join me in welcoming Mark and Casey to the stage. Thank you. Well, well, you made it. I did. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mark Cuban to Mackinac. I'm still, I'm still I'm still picking bugs out of my mouth. A couple of bugs on the ferry. It's an experience, you know? I love when Mark and Arn sells people, come to Mackinac, it's beautiful. It doesn't tell you about the trains, planes, and automobiles you gotta take oh to get here. Oh my God, it was biblical. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so they're not giving us a lot of time. Uh, I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, I gotta tell you, I, I was a little bored over the weekend, so I read your book. Okay. And... <laughs> It was quite fascinating, to All be 64 honest. pages All of 64. it? All 64. He's not giving me any credit for it. Who else read his book over the weekend? Huh? Um, so what was fun for me yesterday as I was preparing for this was asking everybody, how do you think Mark Cuban made his money? And not a lot of people knew. They knew you're a wealthy guy. You own a basketball team. 
but it had something to do with computers. Um, I love the story of how you got into broadcast.com. I mean, obviously, it's a very long story and a lot of pieces, uh, you know, uh, getting fired from your business software, not your business software, but a company <laughs> called your business software. You know, just reading about the heyday of uh, computers was fascinating. Give us, give us a, a real quick uh, recap. How you got in, how you saw it, and, you know, to be able to sell for over $5.5 billion to Yahoo, it, it Say all Say that seemed, again? Yeah. It all seemed pretty, <laughs> pretty nice. Yeah, five and a half, five point seven, seven, I believe. Yeah. Um, basically, a buddy of mine, Todd Wagner, that I went to Indiana University, in, the Indiana University, um, <laughs> with, came to me. We with just about, had a really funny interaction with the president of the University of Michigan not long ago. So yeah, we'll, we'll save that, that one for later. But anyways, he, he came and he said, "Look, this new thing called the internet. This is nineteen late ninety four, early ninety five. There's got to be a way we've got to, li to be able to listen to Indiana basketball over this internet thing. We were in Dallas, and the way we would literally listen to a game is somebody buy a 12-pack, we'd go to somebody's office, we'd get a speakerphone, and we'd call up somebody in Bloomington who would put the speakerphone next to a radio, and we'd listen to Don Fisher make the call, right? That was the only way back then to be able to do it. It seemed nuts. Well, you know, but, it. but the beer was cold, <laughs> and so... There's a lot of that in his book, too, by the way. Yeah, a lot of it. Um, so I was like, okay, look, I'm a, I'm a tech guy. Let me figure it out. And so we started pulling pieces together, and we added a station um, and created this website called audionet.com and added a local radio station, KLIF, and figured out how to put the radio broadcast. It wasn't live then, on demand, on this website called Audionet. And that was 1995, and that was the start of the streaming industry. And that wasn't called, it was called network broadcasting back then, or internet broadcasting. And we just built that up and built that up and built that up until effectively we were, you know, the YouTube of 1998. Um, we went public in July of 1998. It was the biggest IPO in the history of the stock market at the time. And then um, a couple years later, Yahoo bought us for $5.7 million in stock, billion dollars in billion. stock. Billion. Yeah. Um, back then, I mean, that was serious money. Still is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's, that's the short of it, but um, yeah, so yeah, people forget it. Back then it was, you know, it was easy to talk about, but yeah, we literally started the, the streaming industry. And for the finance geeks in the room, that collar deal you did uh, looked yeah. pretty smart too. So when we sold to Yahoo, we sold for stock, not cash. And everybody else was like, you know, the internet stock market's going to keep on going up, keep booming. And I'm like, look, I want to keep that B next to my name. So I'm going to do something called a caller. So I went to my broker, and we sold calls and bought puts. And when the Internet stock market crashed, I literally made a little bit more money and, and protected myself and was able to turn my share of that um, into cash. And it was called one of the top ten trades of all time. So that was nice. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't here, complaining, yeah. A billion here, billion there. Pretty soon you're talking about real It adds money. up real quick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, it bring up the, the past, that, that history piece, only because I think it speaks so much to your personality. And you are an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. So much so that when you were at IU, you started a bar. You not only started a bar, you bought a bar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> until you didn't. Yeah. Um, like, for me to pay for college, my dad did upholstery on cars. My mom did odd jobs. So I pretty much had, I got 20 bucks every couple of weeks, and I had to pay for everything or figure out how to do it. And I borrowed money like everybody and got a little bit of scholarship money, but I always had a hustle. You know, my, my junior year, I had a chain letter um, where I would, it was one of those things where, you know, you <laughs> go, it was 100 bucks, and you sent 50 to the person at the top of the you list. You don't look that so, old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that was, it, it is what it is. Chain letter. Yeah. Chain letter, you know, and so I had to pay for, for tuition, and so that junior year I did that, and then my senior year, a friend, Evan Williams, and I, um, he had some money, and I had uh, my student loan, and we took that money and bought a bar and changed it over to a bar called Motley's Pub. And if we didn't have anybody come in the first night, there wouldn't have been a second night, but we just crushed it. Now, what I'm not telling you is when we started putting the bar together, I wasn't yet 21. And it wasn't until right after um, we opened, right before we opened, that I turned 21. And so I had a lot of friends who weren't 21. And so I would let them all in, and we would have lines to get in. And then one day, um, this was a long time ago, we decided to have a wet t-shirt contest. And 
So none of that would fly at all today, I was today, about obviously. to say, yeah. yeah not going to fly at all. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. But that wasn't the interesting part. What <laughs> <laughs> the interesting part was, there were reporters there and local, and they were taking pictures and everything um, for the local newspaper. So they show a picture of the three finalists. And they had, it was a wet T-shirt that had T-shirts on, right? So let's get that out of the way. Um, and it turns out one of the girls who were in the final three um, was underage and on probation for prostitution. <laughs> and so they said, you know, <laughs> the sirens were coming. And I'm like, and I literally, I, I carded her, I remembered. But yeah, and so we got closed down. <laughs> Which, you know, all things being considered, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with being a bartender or owning a bar, but I'd still be in Bloomington, Indiana. And I go back to visit at IU, and there's still some of the guys that work for me and some of the women that work for me that are working at Nick's, the, the big bar across the street. So you live and you learn. I'm not sure Cranes could have covered that one. <laughs> I'm guessing if it was you, you would have been there with the camera right in the front row. <laughs> We've only known each other for like an hour, all right? See, and I already figured that out. <laughs> um, uh, you also talk about how you knew from a very early age you could never work for anyone else. Yeah. And I think that firing really set it home. And you know, similarly to the bar, you explain these are the, the, you know, some of the best things that ever happened to you. Yeah, I mean, I always got fired. <laughs> you know, Shocker. It was when I got fired from Your Business Software. So I get to Dallas and I graduate from IU, made a few stops back in Pittsburgh, um, go to Dallas because my good buddy Greg Shipper was living there with um, four other roommates, and he was like, you got to come to Dallas. Weather's great. Girls are pretty. The economy's good. I'm like, wait, back up. And uh, I'm like, okay, I'm coming. And so I went down there, didn't have a job, got my first job as a bartender slash bar back at a um, nightclub there, then got a job selling software, except I didn't know anything about software. And so I past the interview, the guy asked me, well, you don't know anything about software. How are you going to sell it? And I was like, well, I'll read the manual. And that's what I did, taught myself. But I was still sleeping on the floor um, in the shithole, excuse my French. And um, I had this chance to make a big sale for what would have been $1,500 in commission to me, which was got what it got me out of that place. And so I go to my boss, Michael Humecki, H-U-M-E-C-K-I. <laughs> And I said, he's gotten over it, I swear. <laughs> no, yeah. I said, Michael, I've got this big deal that I'm going to close. Part of my job responsibilities were to open the store and wipe down the windows and sweep the floor. And I said, I got someone to cover for me. Can I go pick up the check? He goes, no. And I made the executive decision think, thinking, well, when I hand him a $15,000 check, he'd be happy with it. Fired me on the spot. And so I learned a lot of lessons from that about what not to do. And to your point, Casey, you know, the greatest lessons that I learned was from working for the people who were the least successful, because I learned what not to do. Um, Michael Humecki was more concerned about, I remember, look, my, my, I wore a suit to work, but the suits I bought were two for $99, polyester, they would, you can wipe them down, you know, they stood up on their own, and literally the first um, suit shirt I had, the first shirt I wore with a suit, I bought used. First five, first ten, I bought used. The first ties I had, I bought used. The first shoes I had, I bought used. And he was always talking to me about the best place to buy nice glasses or nice suits, and he would never go out and sell. And it really, really hammered home that for any business, anywhere, anyhow, there's never been a business that succeeded without sales. And as an entrepreneur, the number one thing that you can do is sell. Because if you don't love your product enough to go out there and tell every single person on the planet what you do and what you sell and how you can help them, then why are you in the business? Why are you doing what you do? And I also learned very quickly that selling isn't convincing. It's not like, oh, let me convince this person. No, selling is helping. Putting yourself in the shoes of the person that you're selling to and figuring out how you can make their lives better, how you can reduce their stress. Across any business on the planet, if you can figure out how to reduce people's stress and they understand it and they're willing to pay you for that, you're going to make money and you're going to do well. I'm guessing your business software. Yeah, they, they went belly up really yeah. fast. Your business software isn't still around. So 
Listen, I, you know, I'm doing a bunch of research about all your companies. Um, Barn mentioned a couple hundred. You know, there were dozens that I came across. And I'm trying to weave together stories. There's a Sriracha to go company and cutting board companies. And you got this basketball team in there as well. Um, what do you tell people you do for a living? I'm an entrepreneur. Okay. Yeah, I, I like to. Has there ever up. been anywhere you're like, I'm getting in there, I'm going to operate this thing? Yeah, for sure. Costplusdrugs.com, you know, right now. Um, there's nobody on the planet, or in, let's say nobody in the United States who thinks the way they buy their medications and prescriptions We're gonna works We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Okay, what was your question? You get that. Uh, any favorites of all the ones except Cost Plus? Because okay. we've got a whole section on that. Because that was my favorite. All right. Second favorite. That I started? Yeah, or you bought into or you helped grow? I mean, there's a lot of them. I mean, I had a guy one time um, send me an email, and he sold cookies. And I'm like, okay, send me some of your cookies. And the first thing I do when someone sends me a food product or a beverage product is I look on the nutritional label, right? And I look in the back. It's a cookie like that big, and it's kind of an oatmeal-type cookie, and it's got raisins in it. And it was huge, and it was only 190 calories, no added sugar, and it had like seven grams of fiber, protein. I'm like, oh my God, this is like healthy for you. And so I take a little piece off and I was like, this is really, really good. And then I go to pull another piece out and the whole cookie crumbles. And I'm like, all right, now I know what the problem is. I can fix this company. Hmm. And I gave this guy, I think it was 75,000. Right? What's that? Is that butter? No, I did So wait, just hold on, we'll get there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> And so I gave this guy $75,000 for a third of his company. And what I told him to do was, instead of making big cookies, make them into little bites because they'll stay together and you can just pull them open and bite them and everything. And when he did that, they were amazing. Hmm. And he put them in these little containers, ate to a container, and the name of the company is Alyssa's Healthy Cookies. Hmm. And the product is Alyssa's Oatmeal Bites, and there's vegan, they're um, gluten-free. And I said, I'm going to go out one time, and we're going to hand out samples at a local grocery store, and we'll never have to spend a nickel on advertising because they taste so good that people will tell everybody else about them because they check all the boxes. They're healthy. Literally, I eat these cookies. That, this has been 12 years. I eat these cookies almost every morning for breakfast because they're healthy, right? And they don't have added sugar, and they've got the fiber and all that stuff. And that was 12 years ago. This year... Again, we haven't spent a penny on advertising other than me handing out, I was handing out the samples. This year he'll do $23, $24 million in sales. Oh, wow. That's not the good part. He'll make $12 million in profits, third of which is mine, which I like. <laughs> <laughs> but the best part, when he sent me that email, he was living out of his car. And Alyssa's was his, is his daughter's name. And now they've built this big company and he still works his ass off, but he gets to keep the other two-thirds of the $12 million. And they continue to grow a little bit, a little bit at a time. And not a cent on advertising. If he would approach it like a typical company, it would have been, okay, let's go raise money. Let's go do advertising. Let's go this and that. Sometimes when you have a product that fits a specific need, your product can do all the selling. And all you have to do, like I mentioned earlier, is go out and share it with people. Yeah. And so that's what we did. And then we just asked our customers to share it with other people. And then it sold well at this grocery store, and somebody else heard about it, sold at another grocery store, another grocery store. Now we just got it into CVS. And, I mean, it's just, it took 12 years to get to that point, but it started with a guy out of his car. So that was one of my favorites. I thought you were going to say you ate it every morning for breakfast and put on 10 pounds. But no, I, I lose weight. Yeah. Let me just say the fiber works. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me just say for the record, we're a big fan of companies that need a lot of advertising. Right, I know. I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> we'll get to that. <clears throat> Just to help people, as you said. Yeah. So, listen, um, you know, our theme this week, you heard Matt and Sandy a little bit talking about the power of and and coming together. Um, you've seen, as we mentioned, a ton of businesses. I'm sure some with good culture, some with bad. When you think about the power of and, how important is that when you're trying to operate, when you're trying to scale? Uh, oh, incredibly important. So I think what a lot of people, we're going right now through a lot of discussions about woke businesses and not woke businesses and 
DEI and what's right and what's wrong. I'm just going to tell you what I think. Everybody gets their own opinion. You get to, to think what you want. I think your business needs to match the demographics of your prospects and your customers. That whoever you're selling to, you will connect better if the people that work for you look like the people that can buy from you. And when you have those people who look like the people you're trying to sell to, they tend to understand them more, right? They tend to have a better connection. And that allows them to sell. So when you talk about the power of and, you have to look at the people you're selling to and ask, who else can I add? What's the and? Who else can I work with? What organizations? What you know, people? Because everybody in this country, the demographics change and they're continuing to change, but that's where the money is. You know, that's where the opportunity is. And going into communities that don't have investment, don't have people that typically focus there, that's where the biggest opportunities are because no one's looking there. Why do you want to be the 10,001 person doing the same thing when you can go someplace where nobody else is looking and that's where the greatest opportunities are? And so to me, call me woke, but I want, I don't, you don't need to call it DEI, you can call it whatever you want. I call it good business, right? When you're looking like how your prospects look because that's the only way you're going to understand and to me, seeing you know, the ampersand everywhere, the and, that's what it means. It means taking the people that you're selling to and making sure your workforce looks like them and making sure you reflect their values and, and being able to connect to them. That's what works for me and always has. So when you think about, when we're at a policy conference, so when you think about public-private, uh, I'm sure, you know, whether with the Mavs or somebody else, you've had to do some deals with government. Uh, no? All right. Buy the land, build the building. Keep it simple. Yeah, I mean, well, it was built before I got there. Um, but, yeah, I try not to work with government. Okay. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I think Unless you it's cost the... plus drugs, and then yeah. I'm okay. trying to save them money. All right. Uh, so... Uh, that was like three questions, so we got to get through that. <laughs> um, talk about COVID quickly. Uh, uh -huh. You and I had a chance to chat today. We didn't really get to it. When you, I know you're a big technology guy, you know, uh, massive entrepreneur. When you think about what COVID did to consumption habits, to the way people work, um, how are you? Are you looking at things any differently now? Did it, did it see big opportunities for you? I mean, there were a ton of big opportunities. There were, you know, amazing businesses started during the unfortunate times of COVID. But, I mean, people became a lot more comfortable with technology. People became a lot more literate being online and, and dealing with their phones and their PCs. Just, you know, you saw broadband uptake just explode. And so just the natural extension of that is you have to be online. And I don't think that's a surprise. And, you know, now we're seeing more things change with artificial intelligence. And there's the back office side, the AI of machine learning and the like, and then there's the prompt side of ChatGPT, and I was telling somebody today, there's two types of countries, in, there's two types of companies in this country and in the world. Those who are great at AI and everybody else. And I don't care how big you are, how small you are, you have to learn about AI. There was a time, like I talked about when we were getting started, and I would, I would walk in and say, okay, there's this new thing called internet broadcasting, and pretty soon you're going to be able to listen and watch things over your PC, just before the phones could do it, over your PC. And they were like, you moron, I'll just turn on the TV. <laughs> Why would, I'll just turn on my radio. Yeah. And so people didn't look forward like that. And it's the same thing now with artificial intelligence. I don't care if you're a one-man or woman show. I don't care if you have 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 employees. You have to understand how artificial intelligence is going to impact your business operations and how you can make them better and how they're going to impact your customers or prospects or anybody you would deal with. And even though it seems like a lot and it seems like it's complicated, you have to be curious enough to figure it out. Otherwise, someone's going to kick your butt. You know, it's just that impactful. I had a lot of those meetings about the Internet as well. Yeah, I mean, hey, I started selling PCs, you know, back in your business software day for Michael Humecki. Um, <laughs> this poor guy. Just it was like, you know, people didn't Did he change think, his name? I, I don't know. Uh, it's H, if anybody wants to Google. Um, <laughs> but, you know, back then, people were like, I don't need a PC. 
what do I need a PC for? Then it was, I don't need to connect them. That's just the nature of, of people's perception of technology. And so we've all seen, look, no one lives in the, well, anyways, go ahead. All right. Yeah. I've noticed I got to keep you kind of on track here. So uh, what are you trying to tell me? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I've heard you talk before about the year of WTF uh -huh. and the way the economy's going right now. Everything seems politics a little bit upside down. Give us your uh, one minute um, perspective when it comes to how the year finishes up, you know, some big macro trends that you guys are seeing. I mean, hopefully we get the debt ceiling thing done, and that's a fundamental thing. And then, you know, there's so much politics, and there's so much partisanship, and that's so fucked up. Excuse my French. You know? Do we have a beep button around here? Yeah. <laughs> I did tell you we're at a policy conference. It's full of politics. And I told you I didn't care, yeah. right? <laughs> I don't want or need anything from any of you, right? You know? <laughs> I mean, how we select our candidates is a mess. And if that's a mess, everything, all that shit flows downstream. And, and so... We get so caught up in it because in the, and again, it goes, you know, back to technology because we all find our bubbles. You know, when we were growing up, there were three networks, then there were 500, you know, 57 channels and then 500 channels and nothing on. Now there's unlimited channels and everybody has a voice for better or worse. And we pay so much attention to the voices that sound like ours. That's why I think entrepreneurship is so important because as an entrepreneur, you can't get caught up in all that. You have to do what's best for your customers, no matter what they look like. Now, it's not always going to work. You're going to, you're going to have a Bud Light you know, thing happen. He said he wasn't going to talk about Bud Light. Either. And you know what? If I had a Bud Light right here, I'd hold it up and make you all take pictures. <laughs> um, and you're going to have a Target thing happen, right? And that's just the nature of our country right now. But you know what? There was the same kind of shit that happened six months ago, and we forgot about it. And six months from now, that's not going to be important to any business any of you run. And when any of your constituents wake up in the morning, they don't think about Bud Light, they don't think about Target, and they don't think about any of the shit on the other side either. They think about how they're going to live their lives and what's going to give them satisfaction. Because where things start to fall apart is when we have an expectation for our lives and we start thinking we can't get there. That's why I do Shark Tank, because I go on that show and the families watch it together and there are 9, 10, 11-year-old kids. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter where they live. They can get a sense from watching somebody walk on that carpet that the American dream is alive and well. <laughs> Not that it's going to be easy. Not that it's going to be easy. Not that everybody's got the same tools or same assets or resources available to them. But somebody from Michigan, from Kalamazoo, can be on that carpet and start a, a business out of their garage it may only have $30,000 in sales, but maybe they could get on Shark Tank and something can happen. And if we just think about that, that's why entrepreneurship is so important. And let me take that to the next step. Being an entrepreneur, often where we get stuck is we start thinking, I have this idea, I look it up, you get that feeling in your stomach, you're like, ha! Ah, that's a great idea. When are you going to start it? You're like, ha! Ah, I don't know when I'm going to start it, but it's a great idea. I swear, he did not have any of the bourbon they were drinking before. Yeah. But the Tito's was great. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, everybody's had that feeling before, you know, you've had an idea. Everybody in this country is an entrepreneur. That's what makes this country so different from every other motherfucking country, right? <laughs> we all have that little bit of entrepreneurship inside of us that if we just have that one thing that gets us going forward, we can be that entrepreneur that changes the game. Here's what I tell my kids. And then I'll try to get back to my point. That's Sometimes right. I forget um, I tell my kids it, when we're going somewhere, I'm like, look at that, look at that, look at that, look at every single thing that's not organic that you look at. One day it didn't exist. And then somebody came up with the idea to do this, to have those, to have this, and they started a business around it. Why not you? Why can't, why can't it be your idea? And when we think about those things and think about where we can take them, right, anything is possible, and that's what makes this country great. 
And while we argue about who can come in and how they can get in and how they can't get in, when we still need workers, you know, but we, we won't let people in even though we need workers, you know, and when we argue about, well, they're woke and they shouldn't be woke, so we're not going to let Disney build this or Disney's not going to build this. And we're arguing about all this bullshit that makes not a damn bit of difference, right? That's why entrepreneurship is so important. And when you talk about the power of and, right, it's that and when someone says to themselves, why not me? Why can't I start this business? Why can't I be in any town in the state of Michigan and do something special? Everything. In your time, well, I get the shit done. They're literally. <laughs> if I had a mic, I'd drop it after. <laughs> They're literally right there. <laughs> Am I wrong? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe not a policy conference, but Jim, he'd be great for Crane's business. We'll get him going. Okay. <clears throat> plus, let's get you excited about something, Cost right? plus drugs, yeah. yeah. Cost plus drugs. Uh, I mean, you, you do seem like a great guy but it can't be all altruistic. Where did the idea come from? Why does it need to exist? Explain the generics model. Okay, like I said, I'm a salesperson and sales is helping. So costplusdrugs.com, C-O-S-T-P-L-U-S-D-R-U-G-S.com. And what we do is sell drugs. And what we do differently is when the you go to- The good drugs, the good drugs. If, we're, if it's legal, we'll sell it. Um, <laughs> But, but when you go to costplusdrugs.com, what's different is that when you put in the name of the medication and it comes up, we show you our cost. And then we mark it up 15%. And then if you pick it up at your local pharmacy, there's a local pharmacy fee. If we mail it to you, there's a mailing shipping fee of $8. That'll soon be $10. And by doing it that way and staying outside of the way the system works right now, we're able to sell medications for 90 95%. There's samples, you know, for high, high cost generic drugs where we've cut the cost from $30,000 for three months to $60 a month. I mean, it's just insane the way the prices are because what's happened is nobody trusts the way they buy their medications right now. It doesn't Even, make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Even politicians have figured that out, right, that the drug industry is really a mess right now. So with costplusdrugs.com, we decided that we needed a way for people to trust the pricing they're going to get and the medications. And the only way to do that was to be completely transparent and to put our costs up there. And that's what makes us different. So if you run a small business or you're responsible for a community and buying their medications or you're part of the, whoever you, that's buying drugs for whoever, if you go to costplusdrugs.com, we're gonna save you money. And it's just been insane in how much we've been able to grow and how much we're already changed in the industry, and we've only started shipping a year and a half ago. So uh, I know you're a big branding guy, and you forgot the first part of the name. Mark Cubans? Yeah, that's the official name. I mean, um, so... Why, why was that necessary? You know, there's some people who have a lot of money that like to build buildings, put their name on them, get arrested. Um, <laughs> And I've never put my name on, a, on anything before. Probably a good idea, by the way. <laughs> I've, I've never Easy put to my... change the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I never put my name on anything before, but I wanted people to know that this was important to me, and trust was a key element. And by putting my name on it, it was... Before. They have done it before, but what's happened is the big um, pharmacy benefit managers and insurance companies... They've bought them. You know, if I was 25 and started as 35 and, you know, wasn't where I am now, I'd probably take their money and sell it to them too. But my you next dollars, yeah, I don't need the money. I'm the, I'm the luckiest MF in the world, you know. I'm not going to lie. I, but, I, I don't but put it in perspective. You've invested hundreds of millions of your own money into this? Um, a lot, yeah, a lot. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's a lot of powerful people in Washington that probably don't want to see this happen. Uh, are you getting any government fee? No, the, I right, mean, now people, we know how you feel. You don't need the. No, but 
That's what politicians do. You guys are great at that. <laughs> so, so for the business, save money. So for the business people in the room, benefits manager, have any influence on your healthcare costs at all, go to costplusdrugs.com, <laughs> costplusdrugs.com, and just compare pricing. That's what we call earned media, by the way. That is definitely yeah, earned media. Um, <laughs> and so that's our mission. We're, we're really trying to completely upend the whole pharmacy industry. We have a ton to cover in a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, you've, you've put some things out on Twitter recently about, or about Twitter and Elon mm -hmm. and some of the algorithm issues. Current thoughts around Twitter as a platform, uh, one person being in charge of it, and then uh, we'll wrap up with some AI. Um, it's his business. You know, he gets to do whatever he damn well pleases. I don't, you know, I have no say in it. And, you know, do I enjoy the platform as much now as I did then? No, but I, I just don't think there is much as engagement um, on topics. And, but that, that's just my opinion. And, and so, you know, he spent his $44 billion. And he, you know, if he wants to have dancing, he can do whatever he wants. Does he it. respond to you when you make comments? No, he doesn't give a shit what I say. Yeah. You know, and that's okay. I don't really hear what he says. Free speech. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I think, I think I heard you say today that, you know, one of the most important hires or something everyone should be thinking about is AI. You very clearly explained to me how you think about two different versions of AI when it comes to businesses. Run us through them. Run us through the two. Oh, run us through them? Yeah. Yeah, there's, so basically there's, when people talk about AI, it's not just one big um, homogenous thing or technology. There's really two categories right now in, in, in what people are talking about. On the one hand, there's AI, machine learning, neural networks that are more for optimization and improving how you run your business, how you sell things, how you apply um, resources. That, those are things that is one, that's one element of AI that I think people are confusing with what we're hearing about um, ChatGPT, right. right, or Google's version BART. ChatGPT is something that's prompt-based. Now, ChatGPT is amazing. It really, really is. And if you haven't played with it, you really should. Like my 13-year-old son, like kids figure this stuff out so quick. And so he, he went in there and he's like, okay, I need to come up with a good disc for my friend because I'm a Cowboys fan and he's a Giants fan. So write a script of two 13-year-old friends talking trash about the Cowboys versus Giants <laughs> and come up with some really good zingers. And it did. I mean, you know, and that's a business plan to compete with cost plus drugs. And it came up with, a, it wasn't a great one, but it started. Now, it's not perfect. It has these things called costplusdrugs.com, drugs. right? Yeah. Don't forget the dot .com. Um, and Michael Humecki's not involved, so don't worry. <laughs> um, but it's and not perfect because it, it does something with that, that they call hallucinations, right? Where, I'll give you an example. You might have read about it. There was a lawyer who used um, ChatGPT to write a briefing to, for the court. And it literally made up citations for cases that did not exist. <laughs> so in order that gets to, interesting, right? It, that, yeah. Yeah. So in order to really use it well, you have to have the domain knowledge to know what's real and what's not real. But to put it in context, this is ChatGPT4. The iPhone 1. And how far you've come to terrifying. iPhone 14 and those 17. Terrifying. It's, it's exciting and it's terrifying. You know, as a business person, entrepreneur, you put it in the wrong person's hands, it yeah. could be terrifying. And, you know, you guys, you, you know, be asked questions in your positions as politicians, you know, what should we do? You know, typically I'd say, yeah, I don't know that government should be involved. But in this case, we really have to figure it out because there's, we're competing and it's not so much what we do domestically, even though that's important, but we're competing globally. And it's not like the bad guys in other countries don't have the same access. Yeah. Now, again, in this country, as entrepreneurs, that's why this is where a lot of this is coming from, from here. And so we've got to figure out, you know, what the implications are when other countries that may not be our allies get their hands on it. And those aren't easy questions. I don't have specific answers. We're way out of time. I'm going to be in big trouble. The mayor's up yeah, next. Yeah, we'll keep on talking. Sorry, mayor. Yeah. yeah.
Uh, I'll let you apologize for us. Two questions, no. yes or no answer. You really answers. think I'm going to apologize? No. <laughs> uh, two questions, yes or no answers. First one, did Bill Gates really steal your date at a Microsoft party? Not my date, just some girls I was hitting on. Yeah. Two, is there another sports team in your future? No, absolutely not. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Cuban. Thank you. Thank you.